Hello everyone, this week I've got tech news, and I'm going to talk about the Google Nexus 7 that's coming up next on We Talk Nerdy. We Talk Nerdy. We Talk Nerdy.tv is sponsored by UBU Enterprises, specializing in custom business website design, social media marketing, and online branding strategies for companies and products. Hi, thanks for joining me. In this week's tech news, I have news that no one should be surprised by. The research firm IDC reported last week that the PC market suffered its biggest decline ever. PC sales, not including tablets and notebooks, fell by 13.9% to 76.3 million PCs shipped in the first quarter of this year. These results remark the fourth consecutive quarter that PC shipments have fallen. Despite some mild improvement in the economic environment and some new PC models offering Windows 8, PC shipments were down significantly across all regions compared to a year ago, IDC writes. At this point, unfortunately, it seems clear that the Windows 8 launch not only failed to provide a positive boost to the PC market, but appears to have slowed the market overall. To be fair, the IDC numbers here don't include tablets and hybrids, which make up a good portion of Windows 8 market. So the research results here should be taken with a grain of salt. It may be an obvious point, but it seems pretty clear to me that these numbers reflect market saturation for the PC and a shift towards tablets and hybrid devices. I imagine that a lot of people who have a PC if they are upgrading at all in what for many is a difficult economy, they're choosing more mobile options like tablets and hybrids, simply because the standard PC is good enough to do the things they want to use it for, like browsing the web or listening to music. Of course, what it lacks, your desktop PC that is, is mobility. Now, Moore's Law famously states that computers double in speed every two years, right? But do you really need that extra speed? I mean, for a lot of people, the answer is no. What they need is nobility, sorry, mobility, not nobility, not faster CPUs. I expect this trend to continue for a while at least. I imagine things will stabilize at some point, but I certainly don't see the desktop PC going away anytime soon. But in many ways, the PC industry is a victim of its own success. Many people now have a PC that's adequate for what they use it for, um, which is namely browsing the web and entertainment uses. It's people like graphic artists, gamers, editors, scientists, or other creative or nerdy people who need faster, more powerful systems. And if all you're using your for, computer for is surfing the web or entertainment, then chances are there's no real compelling reason for you to replace what you already have and it's working fine. And Microsoft, for its part, has long recognized the need for this mobility. Um, they've been trying for ages to create some sort of a mobile device that had a useful impact on the market. I don't know if you remember the Pocket PC or if you've ever heard about the Microsoft Courier, look it up. The problem was that Microsoft was so focused on shoehorning Windows into a smaller package that these products were destined to fail. Uh, I don't think Windows 8 will save that, but whatever happens, it'll be interesting to watch. In other news, security researcher Hugo Tesso reportedly issued a report that a hacker could gain complete control over an airplane's navigation system using an Android smartphone. Uh, Tesso demonstrated how he used a um, custom application on his Galaxy Nexus, uh, and he was able to exploit certain systems in a plane's uh, avionics. This gave him full control over navigation as long as the plane remained in autopilot and limited control over lesser functions such as the cockpit lights. If the aircraft pilots did not engage manual controls, a hacker could accomplish any number of malicious actions such as crashing one aircraft into another. Tesso accomplished the hack by using his phone to send radio signals to the plane's systems. Now, the plane systems followed his instructions because 
Apparently, they lack security features to determine whether commands were sent by a rogue hacker or by a trusted source, such as uh, a pilot or aircraft controller. However, the hack requires this radio connection uh, with the plane's controls, and the distance between those are limited. So presumably, uh, the hacker, excuse me, <clears throat> presumably the hacker would have to be on the airplane in question. Uh, Tesso created the hacking application by studying and reverse engineering uh, actual aircraft electronics. However, Tesso specifically designed this application to work only within his laboratory environment and not within an actual plane. Uh, now, he claims that these exploits would be effective in a real environment if he had programmed his application differently. He has contacted relevant government authorities and the manufacturers of these electronics uh, as, uh, as well. Uh, now, this research is um, something he's doing to try to rectify the problem, not exploit it in crash airplanes. Though he revealed the existence of these exploits, he didn't publicly disclose this information on how to take advantage of it. Now, the FFA, sorry, the FAA responded to this later in the week, uh, and they said, quote, a German information technology consultant has alleged he's detected a security issue with the Honeywell NZ2000 flight management system uh, using only a desktop computer, although he claims to have been using a phone. Uh, the hack does not pose a flight safety concern because it does not actually work on certified flight hardware. Apparently, the FFA, the FAA, I don't know why I'm having such a problem with FAA. Additionally, uh, the FAA, the FAA said that this does not work on flight certified hardware. Uh, they described the technique uh, cannot engage the control of the aircraft's autopilot system or prevent the pilot from overriding autopilot, meaning that a hacker cannot, contain, cannot obtain full control of an aircraft uh, as the technology consultant has claimed. Now, apparently, certified flight hardware has redundant systems that would prevent a malicious hacker from gaining control of an aircraft. That being said, this is exactly the sort of scenario I spoke about two weeks ago in the case of Andrew Arnheimer. Now, he is, if you'll recall, the hacker who was sentenced to three and a half years in prison uh, for exploiting a hole in AT&T's security network. He stole email addresses of roughly 120,000 iPad users. And I said it before, and I'll say it again, this is exactly the kind of hacking that keeps us safe and should be encouraged, not criminalized. I don't want somebody exploiting a hole in an aircraft security system and doing something they ought not to be doing. This sort of stuff should be researched. It should be encouraged. That way it can be fixed and we'll all be safer. Speaking of aviation hazards, there was a sad report earlier this week about a medical helicopter crash from 2011. The U.S. National Transportation Safety Board ruled that texting while flying has been declared as one of the four contributing factors in the crash. The grim news is thought to be the first time uh, in the U.S. that texting has been linked to a fatal aviation disaster. I saw some sensational headlines along the lines of texting while flying causes fatal crash, but they were actually a bit off the mark. The helicopter ran out of fuel and the engine lost power uh, within sight of the airport. Uh, the NTSB has said that regarding the pilot's cell phone use, uh, they examined it in detail and they had this to say, uh, quote, an examination of cell phone records showed that the pilot had made and received multiple personal calls and text messages throughout the afternoon while the helicopter was being inspected and prepared for flight. During the flight to the first hospital, while he was on the helipad at the hospital making mission critical decisions about continuing or delaying the flight due to the fuel situation and during the accident flight. The NTSB further notes that when the engine died, the pilot wasn't using his phone, 
but the texting and the calls, including those that occurred before and between flights, were a source of distraction that likely contributed to errors and poor decision making. Still, the texting is just one of the four contributing factors cited. The other three were the pilot's fatigue, uh, the pilot's lack of proper training for how to safely land an aircraft that had run out of fuel, and the helicopter company's uh, air methods failure to require automatic notification of unusual fuel readings in the aircraft. In summarizing the findings, the NTSB chairman Deborah Hurstman called out digital distractions in particular, saying this investigation highlighted what is a growing concern across transportation, distraction and the myth of multitasking. Finally, I'd like to tell you the cautionary tale of a guy named Adam Orth. He was a Microsoft Studios creative director who recently came under fire for tweeting that he, quote, didn't get the drama, unquote, over rumors that the upcoming Xbox would require an always-on internet connection. Many in the gaming community objected to what they perceived as dismissive remarks about concern, addressing their concerns. If there's one thing I've learned from working in customer service, it's not to publicly mock your potential customers. Microsoft later issued a statement apologizing for Orth's tweet and clarifying that he was not a company spokesman. As it turns out, Adam no longer works at Microsoft, and it's unclear whether he quit or whether he was fired. Adam is not the first person to lose his job recently uh, over remarks made on Twitter. Uh, a woman named Adria Richards was seated in a ballroom at a tech conference a couple weeks ago when the men behind her uh, made what she perceived as sexually inappropriate jokes. She turned around, took a photo of the two men, and posted it on Twitter with their alleged comments for her thousands of followers to see. Long story short, one of the men she photographed lost his job, and Adria ended up losing her job as well. Uh, the only thing I can really say about this is, let this be a lesson to you kids. Don't say stupid stuff on Twitter. Someone might actually read it. Now, I'd like to talk to you very briefly about our sponsor, UBU Enterprises. Do you need a small website for your business? Maybe you need help managing your business's social media? UBU Enterprises can help you. They have helped me quite a bit. They took my ideas, they added their own flair for design, and helped me get my website exactly where it needed to be. I couldn't have done it without them, and the best part is they're still helping me make sure that my site runs smoothly. Visit them at ubuenterprises.com. For the last couple weeks, we've been talking about the Raspberry Pi, and I thought I would take a break this week and talk about something else near and dear to my heart, which is Android, or specifically the Android Nexus 7. That's this guy right here. The Nexus 7 is not new. It came out last year. Um, but I haven't talked about it, so I thought I would mention it and tell you some of the great features of it. Uh, I'm going to review it for you and show you some tips and tricks that you can use to get the most out of your Nexus 7 if you were to choose to buy one. Uh, and it'll, some of these tricks and tips apply to other Android devices as well. Now, if you're looking for a tablet computer, the Nexus 7 is really a great choice. This is very powerful. You can find the 16 gigabyte model, which is the one I have here, for between $200 and $225. And uh, it does have a couple of weaknesses, but I'm gonna show you how you can work around them. Uh, first, let's talk about what this is. The Nexus 7 was designed and developed by Google in conjunction with Asus, or ASUS, depending on how you think it's supposed to be pronounced. At any rate, uh, this is the first tablet in the Google Nexus series. Uh, it's a line of consumer devices implementing the Android operating system, system and built by an OEM. Uh, the Nexus 7 features a 7-inch display. It has an NVIDIA Tegra 3 quad-core chip, 1 gigabyte of RAM, and it comes in either 8, 16, or 32 gigabyte models. Uh, it has built-in Wi-Fi and something called near-field communication, which is NFC. 
Uh, and just for future reference, we're going to have an episode about NFC in the very near future, because future, uh, it's a really neat technology and you can do some neat hacking with it. And I'll show you some tips and tricks with that uh, in a future episode. At any rate, um, the Nexus 7 is marketed as an entertainment device. Uh, it has integration with Google Play and it serves as a platform for multimedia consumption of ebooks, television programs, films, games, music, and so on. Uh, it runs Android 4.1, uh, also known as Jelly Bean. Now, I've had this tablet for a few months and I have to say I really love it. It's fast, the display is beautiful, the battery life is very good, and it's great for playing games, watching movies, listening to music, or as an e-reader. Um, I've installed the Amazon Kindle app on here, so I have complete access to all my Kindle books. And one of the things I like about this versus, say, um, my old Kindle is that since this has an illuminated display, I can read in the dark, which I can't do with a regular Kindle. Uh, on the other hand, uh, this is difficult to read in bright sunlight, whereas the Kindle works great for that. So there's a bit of a trade-off there. Uh, I have a few games on here. I also have some podcatching software so I can listen to my favorite Twit podcast. Uh, I also have Evernote installed. Now, it's simple to connect uh, to the Google Play Store and download all sorts of apps. There's literally millions of things that you can choose from. Uh, and I have a lot of the same apps on my tablet that I have on my phone. Um, one of the really nice things about uh, having both an Android tablet and an Android phone is that if I purchase an app, uh, I can download it on either device and I don't have to pay twice. Now, I've downloaded a movie trailer from the Play Store uh, and I'll show that to you. Um, you can see how good it looks. Now, the speakers on the Nexus 7 aren't great. Um, it's a small tablet after all. But if you have a Bluetooth enabled speaker like the HDMX Jam that I reviewed in episode four, you can get some pretty good sound out of this. Now, the Nexus 7 isn't just for entertainment. There are also really useful productive productivity tools available for it. Like I mentioned, there's Evernote, and you also have complete access to Google Drive if you need to access any Google Doc files or spreadsheets or any of the other files located on your Google Drive. And since it's an Android device, you have all the usual Google tools like Calendar, Tasks, and Google Maps. Now, the Nexus 7 has GPS as well, so the maps actually work really great on it. Now, let's talk about some of the weaknesses of the Nexus. The first one is the camera. I guess if you're going to make a $200 tablet computer, you have to cut corners somewhere, and Google did that with the camera. As a matter of fact, the Nexus 7 doesn't even ship with the camera app. That's because the Nexus 7 only has a one megapixel front-facing camera. So when you're using it, the camera is facing you. This camera is fine for Skype or video teleconferencing, stuff like that, but that's really about it. If you want to, you can download a camera app, but there's really not much point. It's not a good tablet for taking pictures. Like I said, the camera is only one megapixel, and if you were to try to take a picture, you'd have to point the tablet away from you and press a button on the front to take the picture. You wouldn't even be able to see what you're pointing it at. So again, if you want a tablet that has a good camera, this is not a good choice for you. The second weakness of the Nexus 7 is that it's Wi-Fi only. Now, this wasn't so much of a weakness for me because I don't really want the extra expense of having to pay for a wireless data plan. Uh, I'm spending more than enough money each month on uh, my cell phone bill and you know I don't really want to pay an ex to pay for an extra data plan for a tablet on top of what I'm already paying for my phone. Uh, for some people not having the option to connect the Nexus with uh, without a Wi-Fi connection could be a real negative except that there's actually a really clever way to get around this uh, if you have the right hardware and software and I'm going to show you how to do that. First, you need to have a phone that either allows tethering or one that can create a wireless hotspot. Sorry about that. I had to take a quick break because I left my phone in the other room. At any rate, um, 
there, like I said, there's a really clever way to get around the fact that the Nexus 7 doesn't have uh, cellular data connectivity. Uh, now, if you have uh, a phone that allows tethering or a phone that allows um, uh, you to create a wireless hotspot, you can use that to allow your Nexus 7 to talk through your phone and get data. Now, tethering is when you connect your phone to the tablet using a cable, a USB cable. The, the phone in this case sort of acts like a modem. Uh, it allows you to connect to the internet. Uh, the data goes through the phone uh, using a wireless uh, cellular connection and then the tablet can use that uh, just like you as if you were on the internet. Uh, now my phone is a Galaxy Nexus which could do the job but my service provider uh, won't allow me to use tethering. Uh, but I can do the next best thing that is I can turn my phone into a wireless hotspot. Now as I mentioned this is an Android phone and I don't know if this is possible on an iPhone. It might be. Uh, in theory, if you could turn your iPhone into a wireless hotspot, it would work just as well. You don't need to have two Android devices necessarily. But like I said, I don't have an iPhone and I don't know if this is possible. Um, but if you have an iPhone and you know that you can turn it into a wireless hotspot, send me an email. I'd love to hear about it and I'll pass along the information on how to do that. So on an Android phone, if you open your settings and go into wireless networks, then click on more, you may see an option for tethering and portable hotspots. If you're using a different version of Android, your menu may not look the same as mine. Now, I'm using Android 4.0, AKA ice cream sandwich on my phone. Anyway, when I click on it, I get an error message that says, if you'd like to subscribe to mobile hotspot broadband blah 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 call my carrier. Now they would very much prefer it if I would pay extra for this service. My contract with my carrier allows me four gigabytes of wireless data each month which is pretty good uh, and I see no reason why I shouldn't be why I should have to pay extra uh, as I'm sending the data through the phone to another device. It's really six of one, half a dozen of the other. I don't see how those are functionally different. Uh, but my carrier would like me to pay for data for my phone and data for my tablet. But they can't actually prevent me from hooking this up. All I need is some software. Now, if you search the Google Play Store for a wireless hotspot, uh, you're going to find a number of free apps that will allow you to turn this on. I picked one called Portable Wi-Fi Hotspot Free. Pretty simple name, right? It couldn't be simpler to use either. If you run the app, it turns on your hotspot. Then you can configure the settings by touching the icon in the notification window, or you can configure the name of the network and you can password protect it as well. Now, when I go to my Nexus 7, I see a new wireless hotspot. In this case, it's called Android AP. All I have to do is connect to it and I'm ready to go. I can use the phone's wireless network from my Nexus 7 and this may not be a perfect solution, but since I always have my phone with me anyway and I have a pretty good data plan, like I said, of four gigabytes per month, it actually works really well for me. And I don't have to pay that extra money uh, for the tablet when I'm away from my Wi-Fi network. The last shortcoming of the Nexus 7 is its storage. The Nexus 7 comes in 8, 16, and 32 gigabyte versions, and the device itself doesn't actually have a expandable memory slot for an SD card or anything like that. Now, I have the 16 gigabyte version, and I would not recommend uh, that you get the 8 gigabyte version. Yes, it's a little bit cheaper, but 8 gigabytes will really limit how much stuff you can put on your Nexus. Um, I think you would definitely be spending a lot of time taking stuff off, trying to make room for the things you want on there. Don't get the eight gigabytes, get at least 16, or if you can afford the extra 30, 50 bucks, whatever it is, get the 32 gig version. What the Nexus 7 does have going for it is something called USB OTG, uh, or USB on the go. 
This is an awesome feature, uh, the Nexus 7, and you might have it on your Android device too. Uh, it's on my phone, and uh, I understand that it's on a lot of different phones. If you have an Android phone or tablet, you might be able to use USB OTG uh, if the manufacturer of the phone has enabled it. Even the Kindle Fire HD, which is Android based, can use it. USB on the go is a specification that allows devices to act like a host, allowing other USB devices uh, like flash drives, uh, mice and keyboards to be attached to them. In other words, all you need is a special little cable, like this one here, and you can attach extra memory in the form of a USB flash drive. Uh, you can also connect keyboards, mice, and even um, Xbox USB game controllers. Now, I bought this cable for about $2 on Amazon. Uh, and here, I'm using a USB hub to, to connect a keyboard and a mouse to my Nexus 7. As you can see, I can control a pointer and type with the keyboard, just like any other computer. Now, there's one little detail about attaching a USB flash drive to your Android device. In order to get it to work, your device needs to be rooted. That might sound a little scary, but it's really not a big deal. I've rooted both my Android phone and my Android tablet. And let me explain what that means. As you may or may not know, Android is based on the Linux operating system. And just like in Linux, when you perform certain system operations, you need root permission. And root is the default name of the administrator account. So really, rooting your phone is just giving yourself permission to do things that are normally reserved for system administrators. In this case, we want to be able to mount and unmount a volume, which is our flash memory stick. This is an activity that normally requires administrative privileges. That's why you need to have those privileges set up on your phone or tablet in order to be able to access this little memory stick because rooting and unroot, sorry, mounting and unmounting a volume is normally reserved for system administrators only. Now, I'll probably talk about how you can root your device in a future episode. It's kind of complicated, and unfortunately, it's a little bit different for everybody, so uh, I can't give you a generalized uh, description of how to root your device. The simplest thing for you to do is, if you really want to root your Android device, go on to Google and type in how to root my, and insert your device name here. Um, you'll probably find lots of people who've already done it, and usually the instructions are pretty simple and fairly step straightforward and step-by-step. Step. Now, there are a few other reasons why you might want to root your phone, uh, but all I really want to do right now is demonstrate how to use a flash memory stick with a Nexus 7. So let's assume that your device is rooted, and once you've done that, all you need is a free piece of software called Stick Mount. Uh, you install, you download and install Stick Mount from the Google Play Store, and once you've installed it, all you have to do is attach your uh, flash memory stick uh, using your USB on-the-go cable, and Stick Mount will automatically recognize it, mount it, and make it available for reading and writing operations. Then you can use any of the freely available file manager programs like Astro File Manager or HD File Manager. It'll, to allow you to copy files back and forth, you can delete files, whatever. Uh, for example, you could fill up your memory stick with music and movies uh, for when you travel. That's what I did when I went to Europe last fall. Uh, I never had to worry about uh, running out of entertainment. This flash, flash drive is uh, 64 gigabytes and it accessed perfectly good on my Nexus 7. Now, for whatever reason, uh, I think it's too large to mount on my phone, um, so that's something you should be aware of. Um, I can confirm that a 64 gig flash drive will mount on a Nexus uh, 7, um, but your phone or some other Android device might not be able to access um, such a large drive. So you might have to go with a smaller 32 or 16 gig memory stick uh, if you can't get larger ones to work. Uh, by the way, the stick mount is not limited to just flash memory sticks. Uh, if you have an externally powered hard drive, 
uh, you can hook that up to your Android device in exactly the same way. And that can be a great way of backing up pictures or videos or transferring files back and forth from your desktop computer to your mobile device. So in conclusion, yes, the Nexus 7 does have some shortcomings. But as I've shown you here today, there are some pretty clever workarounds uh, for dealing with its limited built-in memory and lack of wireless cellular connectivity. For a tablet that is half the price of an iPad, and in my estimation equally as powerful, this is a really great device. I definitely give it five stars. Well, that's it for this week. I hope you've enjoyed the show. Uh, if I can get my act together, I'm going to show you another segment on the Raspberry Pi next week. Uh, this time, I'd like to go into more detail about installing and running a BitTorrent client on the Raspberry Pi. And I'd like to show you how you can write some simple programs for some electronics projects. Uh, I'd like to show you how you can turn some LEDs on and off uh, with the Raspberry Pi. And my goal is to get you started down the road towards thinking about the sorts of things you can do. Not hey, turning on an LED is not that big of a deal, but it's a demonstration of how you can use a Raspberry Pi to A, teach your kids about uh, electronics and programming, uh, but also how you can start to think about how you can use these technologies to control your world. The Raspberry Pi is a great little device uh, for all sorts of electronic projects. You could dream up all sorts of things where perhaps you um, are want to roll your own uh, home automation system so that you could have the Raspberry Pi turn on and off lights or um, other devices uh, on a set schedule, or you could even set it up so that you could control those things via the internet. Uh, anyways, uh, I'd like to try and talk about that next week. Like I said, if I can get my act together, um, I'll hopefully have that demonstration for you then. Uh, and remember, if you have questions or problems and you need answers, uh, please send me an email uh, at wetalknerdy.tv at gmail.com. Thanks again for watching. I'll see you next week. on here.